As we continue to work our way through the study of what we believe as a Bible Presbyterian Church, uh, Dr. John Battle, President of Western Reformed Seminary, will, will be speaking to us this evening on Christ and the Covenant. Before he comes to speak to us, we're going to call upon Reverend Jason Hutchinson to read the scriptures to us. 2 Corinthians 3, verses 1 through 6. If you are able, would you please stand in honor of the reading of God's Word. The Word of God to God's people. Do we begin again to commend ourselves, or need we, as some others, epistles of commendation to you, or letters of commendation from you? Ye are our epistle written in our hearts, known and read of all men. For as much as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not in tablets of stone, but in fleshly tablets of the heart. And such trust have we through Christ to Godward, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God, who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. Grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of the Lord remains forever. You may be seated. Well, good evening, everyone. It's such a pleasure to be able to address you on this important occasion once a year when we read all the names of our Bible Presbyterian ministers and elders who've gone on to be with the Lord. Every year that list gets a little bit longer. And uh, as the names are added, more and more people just know a small percentage of those names. Now, uh, I've had the fortune, good fortune, to live long enough to know many of those who are ministers in our denomination, but there are some that I did not know. And as far as the elders of the various churches, uh, there are many of those names that we were read that I don't remember the particular individual, although I've met some of them as well. But one thing you'll notice as you read through that list, that this is not a list of Olympic champions. It's not a list of presidents of the United States. It's not a list of Mr. and Mrs. America. It's a list of very ordinary people. And as I think of a lot of these people, there are people like when you go to church Sunday night and you hear somebody's preaching, my first thought would be, well, I'll try to keep awake. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, <laughs> just as many of you probably are thinking right now. <laughs> they were not the most gifted orators. Uh, many of them were not the greatest theologians. Uh, some of them had ideas I consider to be rather odd and strange. But yet, their names are on this list. And we honor them. And we remember them. And I'm glad to know, if I live long enough, or if, I guess if I don't live long enough, <laughs> if you live long enough, that my name will be read in your ears someday. <laughs> And my thought is, probably by that time, there'll be too many names to be read, and I'll never get my name read. <laughs> but if you hear my name, you may have similar thoughts. Say, well, he was an interesting character, but uh, <laughs> the Lord chooses not many noble, not many wise. 
But you know, you read through that list, and the ordinariness of the people does strike me. And it probably strikes you too if you know some of these people. I love dearly my old pastor, uh, John E. Janbaz. And uh, this, this year, the Synod passed a memorial resolution remembering him. And Brother Pine and I both were brought up in the church where he was a pastor in San Bernardino, California. Brother Rogers and other people have met him and uh, have had many experiences with him through the years. I found him to be a wise man, but a very low key man. And uh, he had one joke that he told almost every sermon. <laughs> And I feel like in my memory of Pastor Jambez, it would not do well to let that slip. <laughs> but I'll, take, I'll tell it a lot quicker than he did. <laughs> but he told about the preacher who had a habit of slipping a cough drop in his mouth when he started preaching. And when the cough drop melted, he knew it was time to wind up and quit. But this one Sunday, he just kept preaching on and on and on and on. The people were looking at their watches, and he was wondering himself. He'd already covered all his points once or twice. And he finally looked out, and he had taken out of his pocket, he had pulled out a button. <laughs> <laughs> so there, there you've heard Pastor Jambaz. It's funny the first time you hear it. <laughs> and, but he told that so often, and I never think of him without thinking of that little story. <laughs> How wonderful it is to have these memories. And you know, when you remember your relatives, your grandparents, and those who have gone before your family, do you remember how wonderful and great and sterling and strong and brilliant they were? Usually not. Usually you remember other little things about them, uh, little characteristics, little foibles, and things like that. And we love them even uh, for those things. And God chooses us not because we're the best and the greatest, but he chooses us because his spirit has prepared our hearts to submit to his leading, to be vessels of him. And tonight, I have a double duty. One is to go through Westminster Confession, chapters 7 and 8, which is no small thing in itself. Chapter 7, God's covenant with man. Chapter 8, Christ our mediator. That, that's uh, enough for five or ten minutes right there. <laughs> and then also to talk about those who have gone before us in the Bible Presbyterian Church. So here's my plan. We're going to look at the scripture to see why Christ and his covenant are vital to our ministries and we're vital in the ministries of those who have gone on before us. Then we're going to look through those two chapters of the confession very briefly, and then we're going to go back again and think, how can we honor and imitate those who have gone before us, who were ministers of the new covenant, just as, as we are. So first of all, let us turn in our Bibles to first, or set, rather, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, a passage that was just read to us. And I'd like to read to you, as you're turning to that verse, I'll read to you the verse out of Hebrews, which is often used in this regard. Hebrews 13, verse 7. Remember them which had the rule over you, and have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation. We are to remember those who have gone before us, and we are to imitate them, that verse tells us. Now here in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, we see why we are to remember and honor them. And the reason is they are ministers of the new covenant. The Apostle Paul in verse 6 says that God hath made us able ministers of the New Testament. And the word testament here is the same word as covenant in the Greek, the new covenant. Not of the letter but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. We remember them because they were ministers of the new covenant. And now look for a moment down in chapter 4 of 2 Corinthians and verse 5. 
For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves, your servants, for Jesus' sake. The minister of the new covenant preaches Jesus Christ and not himself. And it is the fact that these men preached Christ that made them examples for us. And that's what gave them the power, the power that the new covenant speaks of, the power to change the hearts, to make our hearts a heart of flesh, and to cause us to love the Lord and to follow him. This covenant promise made through Jesus Christ is what they preached, and they did it as servants. And God was the one who made them able ministers. Now let us turn back here for a moment, back to chapter 3 of 2 Corinthians. I'd like to talk to you what Paul meant when he says that you are letters written to us. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, the first three verses, the Apostle Paul speaks that of God sending a letter to him, to Paul. He says, do we begin again to commend ourselves, or need we as some others, epistles of commendation to you, or letters of commendation from you? For you are our epistle, written in our hearts, known and read of all men. For as much as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshy tables of the heart. God has sent a letter to Paul. Now in this whole passage of 2 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul is telling about his experience with that church at Corinth and how in spite of all the difficulties and troubles and persecutions Paul has endured and all his anxiety for that church, God has sustained him and blessed him and given him a glorious ministry. And uh, that those whole that section, starting at chapter 3, going for several chapters, has been called the glory of the ministry. There's a wonderful book written by A.T. Robertson on, with that title that goes through these chapters of 2 Corinthians. And the glory of the ministry is not that we live glorious lives and live in the four-star hotels and jet around the country. Our glory is that we are ministers of the powerful new covenant of God. And the power of that new covenant comes through Jesus Christ. And Paul says, whenever I get discouraged and downcast, I think of what God has done. God has sent a letter to me, commending me as a minister of the new covenant. And when I open that letter, it says, it's kind of like those old days. Remember when you were a kid, you made a church? Did you ever do that? Yeah. Here's a church. Here's a steeple. Here's a steeple. Open the doors. And there's the people. Did you ever do that? Okay. I used to do that when I was a little kid. Sitting in the pew in the Lutheran church while the uh, boring sermon was going on. <laughs> Actually, it was probably a wonderful sermon, but I missed it. <laughs> but the people... God sent a letter to Paul, and he says, this letter is you. You are the letter that God sent to me. When I think, oh, my life is so worthless and fruitless and painful, God shows me you, you people. You are God's letter of commendation. And the letter is not written with ink on paper but it's written by the Spirit of God on your hearts. And when I see your hearts changed by the power of the Spirit of God, that's the letter that God sends me to encourage me as a minister of Jesus Christ. That's the proof that I am an able minister of the new covenant. God's letter to Paul. And in particular, as he wrote 2 Corinthians, the thing that especially God wrote to Paul was that these Corinthian Christians have been in deep sin in that church. 
And Paul worked with that church and he prayed over that church. He wept tears as he wrote to them, as he sent ambassadors to them, as he himself traveled to them on one occasion. And it just seemed to get worse and worse. And he wrote 1 Corinthians. And then later he said, I wrote you with many tears. And then he sent Titus to them. Titus, please go find out what's happened. Bring back good news, please. <laughs> and Titus came back and he met Titus on the way. And Titus said, they've repented. They've repented. And how they repented. They have wept. They are showing great zeal and they love you Paul they want to see you and they want to be restored to your fellowship and that's when he wrote this letter and he said God has sent me a letter and it's the spirit of God working in you that's the powerful ministry of the new covenant changing hearts writing his law in the hearts of his people that new covenant was promised in the Old Testament. The prophets, of course, in Jeremiah talks about, I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel, write the law in their hearts. T talks about it in Ezekiel. He says, I'll take out your heart of stone, give you a heart of flesh, and I'll put my spirit within you. And so we have these promises of the new covenant. And Paul says, I'm seeing this going on right in your hearts. So that's how we know we're ministers of the new covenant. Now we're going to take a few minutes and look at that new covenant and at Christ, the mediator of the covenant. Then we'll come back and look at how we imitate those who are ministers of the new covenant. So if you have a copy of the Westminster Confession with you, we'll be looking at chapter 7 and 8. I'm assuming that most of you don't. So I have uh, placed it on my computer here, and I've left out some of the phrases just because of the time constraints, but uh, most most of the text is here, and we'll just go through it little, little by little. <clears throat> so there's a little secret door here. That's not it. <laughs> That's not it either. Okay. Oh, I need to push this button. No. No? I don't need to push that button. Oh, I slid the wrong slide. Okay, I did this one. Okay. I'm glad... The brother Ron here knows what he's doing. I wonder if they'll have projectors in heaven. <laughs> What's that? Holograms. Holograms. Oh. No technology. Okay, here we go. Okay, there we go. Can you read that? It's kind of faint right now, but I think it'll get better. Yeah, you turn it off so it's come back. Yeah, I <laughs> I didn't turn it off. <laughs> Your friends all tell you the story. <laughs> okay. Christ and the covenant. And these two chapters of confession are really the heart of the gospel. If you want to be a gospel preacher, or you want to be a witness for Christ, give the gospel. These two chapters are a good start. All right. I'll just go through it rather briefly and mention a few things. The first section says that God was so good to us to give us covenants. And it says the distance between God and a creature is so great that although reasonable creatures do owe obedience unto him as their creator, yet they could never have any fruition of him as their blessedness and reward, but by some voluntary condescension on God's part, which he hath been pleased to express by way of covenant. God is so great compared to us. He could have created us, and technically speaking, if he was not the good God that he is, he could have just let, let us drift along in space until uh, oh, forever, and that would have been that. But God wanted something better for us. God's goodness to his creation required that he reveal himself to that creation and show them how they could have, as it says here, their blessedness and reward. And this, the confession calls a voluntary condescension. It's kind of nice I can move this around and that stays still. That's, the, that's good. All right. Now this voluntary condescension, I have a special, there we go. The word condescension is a late Latin word that has come into English 
And it means literally to come down to be with someone. Uh, the Webster's Dictionary says, a voluntary descent, a voluntary coming down from one's rank or dignity in relations with an inferior. It really doesn't give a, a motive. It can be a good motive or a bad motive. It could be something that this inferior person deserves or it could be something that they don't deserve. That's not the point. The point is that you are having a relationship with an inferior that requires you to come down from your own dignity or rank to associate with that inferior, to change that relationship. And God has done that with us. Now there's quite a conflict going on in some circles as to is this a gracious covenant or the covenant God made with Adam? Is that a gracious covenant or not? The confession doesn't use that term as we'll see, but it uses this term of a condescension. Usually when the confession speaks about grace, it's talking about unmerited favor where we actually have done nothing or don't do anything to deserve this and even have sinned against God and he overcomes that by his grace. So uh, we'll get to that in a minute, but it uses that word condescension. God brings himself down to communicate with us. The second section deals with this covenant that God made with Adam, the covenant of works. The first covenant made with man was a covenant of works, wherein life was promised to Adam and in him to his posterity upon condition of perfect and personal obedience. In the catechism it says, when God created man, he entered into a covenant of life with him. So in the catechism, it calls it a covenant of life. In the confession, it calls it a covenant of works. And both titles are appropriate because works tells you how Adam was to achieve this goal. And of course, life tells you what the goal was. And it was a requirement that he obey the Lord. Perfect obedience is what he had to do. And, uh, you know, see, I believe I talked, yes, well, let's, let's go back here for a second. Um, this obedience of Adam was to be, most theologians believe, and it's apparent uh, for a time, a time of probation. And then God would have confirmed him in life. But if he failed the test, then he would have death. Um, uh, this covenant, the covenant of works, is an important part of theology. And it enters once again into the picture when Jesus himself obeys God and uh, fulfills totally all the law that God has given to his whole moral law that God gave to Adam and Eve. Jesus completely fulfilled that law. And uh, it's a principle of God that those who obey them, he blesses. Those that disobey, suffer judgment. Then we come to the third section, the covenant of grace. Man by his fall, having made himself incapable of, lo of life by that covenant, the Lord was pleased to make a second, commonly called the covenant of grace, whereby he freely offereth unto sinners life and salvation by Jesus Christ, requiring of them faith in him that they may be saved, and promising to give unto all those that are ordained unto life his Holy Spirit to make them willing and able to believe. So the covenant of grace is made between God and the sinners. And the requirement here is not perfect obedience, which is impossible, but rather faith in Jesus Christ. And if we have faith in Jesus Christ, then the promise is that we would have life and salvation. But this covenant is based on not the goodness of that faith or the value of that faith, but it's rather based on the sacrifice, the death, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that gets into the chapter on Christ, the mediator. But we notice here, it does say, offers them salvation and life by Jesus Christ. He is the means. He is the agent that brings this about. And also it says that the faith that we have that's required of us is also obtained for us by Jesus Christ because it says he gives those the faith to believe that are ordained unto life. And this is the gift of God. So 
The covenant of grace, then, you might say, replaces that covenant of works after the sin of Adam. Sometimes this covenant is called a testament. In section 4 of the Confession talks about this. The covenant of grace is frequently set forth in Scripture by the name of a testament. A testament is, you know, what is a testament? What's the four-letter word? A will. Right, a will. You write your last will and testament. And it has no effect whatsoever until something happens. You die. Yeah. <laughs> so if you write, if, if I if I promise my will to give you all my money, you don't get a red penny until I die. And if I change my mind the day before I die and change that will, then you're just out. So it requires the death of the person. And, and in Hebrews chapter 9, it uses the same word. It's translated covenant. It uses the word there for it, the word testament. And it talks about the death of the testator, the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. So in this section of the confession, it says it's like a will, but it's also like a covenant. Covenant is like an agreement or an arrangement between people. So these different terms both refer to the covenant of grace. The last two chapters of this section on the covenant with man deal with dispensations. And... Uh, um, I have omitted a lot of the text because there are a lot of details in the text and we don't have time tonight to go through it. But basically, the first section 5 talks about in the Old Testament and the, new, and the uh, section 6 talks about the New Testament. And it says that this covenant, this covenant of grace, was differently administered in the time of the law, that would be in the Old Testament, and in the time of the Gospel, which would be the New Testament. And then it says that uh, there are not, therefore, two covenants of grace differing in substance, but one and the same under various dispensations. The word dispensation is the word, uh, in Greek, the word for economy. It's, it's an arrangement and administration. And under that covenant of grace, God had various periods of history when he operated it in a different way. So you have the time... Uh, before Abraham. Then you had the time after Abraham, and things were different. You had circumcision. And then you had, after Moses, things were changed a lot. You had the tabernacle and the priests and all the sacrifices and so forth. And then after Jesus, things changed again. And you had the end of all those sacrifices and that uh, Levitical priesthood and uh, the institution of the Lord's Supper and, and baptism and a much simpler uh, worship. Plus you had the Gentiles admitted into the church as equals with the Jews. So a lot of changes took place from the Old Testament to the New Testament, but yet the way of salvation, the plan of God, the death of the Redeemer for salvation was still true for both of those. And for all those dispensations, you had that one covenant of grace working out through history. And uh, that's the point made here by uh, the confession. So if you believe in these dispensations, that doesn't make you a dispensational list. Because if you believe that there is a covenant of grace that is over all these dispensations and that regulates them, then you would be a covenant theologian. And uh, But all covenant theologians do recognize the existence of various dispensations, as, as it's mentioned here in our confession. So that's chapter 7. Wow. Okay. Now, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's like uh, you drive through the little town and you say, where did it go? You know. <laughs> but you can study this for, for months and years, and it's so rich in the scripture. And I don't want you to get the idea that it's all very simple and easy and we're just zipping through it. But for tonight, as we survey these things, we see that this covenant of grace is what God instituted for our salvation. And in chapter 8 of the confession, it talks about Christ as the mediator of that covenant. Christ the mediator. God chose the Lord Jesus Christ to be the one who would implement that covenant of grace and be the agent in carrying it out so that we could be saved in him. And so chapter 8 talks about the Lord Jesus, the glory of the Lord, 
in chapter 8. And once again, it's like I was talking to Brother uh, John Blizzard this afternoon. He says, well, if we visit London, we have six days there. What can we do? It's sort of like that. You know, you can do 10% of the things you want to do. But uh, going through this chapter here in these few minutes, it's the same thing. But what a blessed chapter it is as it exalts our Lord Jesus. In the first section, it talks about Christ as the mediator. It pleased God in his eternal purpose to choose Bain, the Lord Jesus, his only begotten son, to be the mediator between God and man, unto whom he did from all eternity give a people to be his seed, to be by him in time redeemed, called, justified, sanctified, and glorified. We see that God chose the Lord Jesus Christ and ordained him to be the mediator between God and man, and he gave to Jesus Christ a people to be his. Well, that's an interesting gift. But that gift of the people to Jesus Christ is based on the work that he would do. And the covenant that we speak of this covenant of grace is based on what Jesus did to obtain the blessings of this covenant for himself and thereby for us. So we are the prize that Jesus earned, you might say. <laughs> the covenant of redemption. This is a term that's often used for the arrangement between God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, sometimes you hear it stated between the Father and the Son, and I myself have often said that, but Brother Lethem's book, I think, uh, helps in this area. Uh, he has written quite a bit on the subject of the Trinity, and he points out something I think that's a good point. The covenant was not made between God the Father and the divine Son of God in the sense that you had two different wills, you might say, within God, where... They may come into an agreement of some kind. Because God doesn't come into agreements. God always is. He is always the same. He doesn't change his decree from one point to another. But there is a covenant between God, the triune God, and the Lord Jesus Christ, the God-man. And so when we think of the covenant of redemption, I think that's better probably to think of it in that way. That God made a covenant with Jesus Christ, that Jesus Christ would, the Messiah, would indeed obey him, keep the law of God, die for his people, and then be raised again. And that as a reward for that, God would give to the Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah, a kingdom for his name. And that promised kingdom includes you and me. We are the promised seed of that kingdom. You probably noticed the particular redemption theme. It says here to give a people to be his seed in time to be redeemed. Jesus redeemed a people, and that same people that he redeemed are called justified, sanctified, and glorified. And there you have what's often called the limited atonement, uh, the particular redemption that Jesus died, not for everybody in the world equally, but he died for his own elect. And this is one of the points of Calvinism that is probably the most fought over and one which we as Presbyterians have a hold to. And uh, I just want to tell you a little story about one of my students at Faith Seminary years ago. I guess I can tell you his name, but I won't. <laughs> but he was a young man from a, a rather large uh, Christian college in the South, in uh, South Carolina. And uh, <laughs> he was he was one of these men, young men, you know, when you first learned about the doctrines of grace, how you were so enthusiastic, and you want to get everybody on board with you and to see these great, wonderful truths, and he'd argue with the students in the dorms at night, and he'd ask questions of the professors and embarrass them, by, you know. So he was called into the dean's office. And he told the story when he got to the seminary. So he was called into the dean's office, and uh, I don't know which dean it was, but uh, he, he uh, told him that, he was not giving 
proper doctrine, he's causing trouble in the school, and he had to stop, stop, cease and desist, this type of argumentation. And he says, well, I'm just saying the things that the Presbyterians believe, and you allow that here. And, and uh, they said, well, you're, you've gone beyond. You're, you're a hyper-Calvinist. He says, what do you mean? He says, well, we believe that it's okay if you're a Westminster Calvinist, but you are a Dortian Calvinist. He says, what do you mean by Dortian? He says, you believe in the Synod of Dort, you know, the five points. So uh, this poor student at that point, you know, he had never heard this before or since. Uh, <laughs> but uh, in truth, the five points uh, which were specified in the Synod of Council at Dort uh, are indeed contained within the Westminster Confession. And here is evidence of that. So if you believe in the particular redemption of the Lord Jesus Christ, you are not only agreeing with the Synod of Dort, you're also agreeing with the Westminster Assembly and uh, with me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so one of our Greek teachers used to say, he used to say, I scholar, I know this. Right? <laughs> Settled all arguments. <laughs> okay, but it just, I just have a list here of four places in our confession in this chapter where it speaks about the limited atonement or particular redemption. That Jesus died to for a people, to give a people. All those the Father has given to him. He did it for the elect, for all those for whom Christ hath purchased redemption. It's very clear in this chapter that Jesus died for a particular group of people and that those people will indeed come to salvation. The second section deals with Christ, the God-man. The Son of God, the second person in the Trinity, being very and eternal God of one substance and equal with the Father, did when the fullness of time was come take upon him man's nature with all the essential properties and common infirmities thereof, yet without sin, so that the two whole, perfect, and distinct natures, the Godhead and the manhood, were inseparably joined together in one person without conversion, composition, or confusion. This is talking about how Jesus became the person who could carry out the Father's will and become our mediator. Jesus, as the divine Son of God, exists from all eternity. And this divine nature took to itself, it says, a human nature, man's nature. And uh, again, our author that we're looking at in this week makes a good point. It's not where you take a divine nature and a human nature and put them together. It's not like that. But Jesus was already the divine nature. And the human nature was added to him. He, it was addition. It wasn't multiplication or something like that or a mixture or compound, but it was addition. He's God and he takes the human nature. And the human nature of the Lord Jesus Christ was joined in a way that cannot be separated, but a way that is a mystery to us. It was joined to his existing divine nature. And he is still one person, but now with a human nature. So in eternity, Jesus exists as God. He never changes. He is always God. But in time that he has created, he also exists as man. And we all live in time. We all live in the universe that God created that includes time in it. And so as long as we are living, which is forever and ever, Jesus will be God and man together. And this is one of the great truths of the Christian faith. It's been often pointed out that Christianity must be from God because nobody would ever make this up. It's something totally beyond anything would make up if they were starting a new religion and wanted to get lots of converts. They wouldn't think of something like this. But God, in his total and complete wisdom, saw fit to add humanity to Jesus Christ and make him a God-man, what's called a God-man, within time. And he, as God and man, together, in one person, is able then to do all the things necessary to be our mediator. So we have two whole, perfect, distinct natures, but in one person. And this is without conversion, composition, or confusion. 
It's not like God changed in the man. It's not conversion. It's not, you took a little bit of God, a little bit of man, and you kind of mix them up together. It's not composition. And it's not, well, some of the time he's this, but some of the time he's that, and maybe I don't know what he's going to be next. It's not confusion. It's solid, reliable, consistent addition of a human nature to his divine nature. Therefore, he is qualified to be our Messiah, to be our mediator, the Lord Jesus, in his human nature, thus united to the divine, was sanctified and anointed with the Holy Spirit above measure, that he might thoroughly be thoroughly furnished to execute the office of mediator and surety, which office he took not unto himself, but was thereunto called by his Father. The Lord Jesus Christ, as God and man, is now able to carry out these functions, and his human nature is made perfect and, and uh, powerful by the Holy Spirit of God. And so we see the Lord Jesus in the Gospels, praying for strength, praying that God would help him um, in his weakness and fear, calling on his Father and the angels coming to support him. So we see a human nature, but a human nature that is strengthened and made uh, suitable and adequate and abundantly good as our Savior. When he obeyed the Father then, the Lord promised the reward for him. It says, this office the Lord Jesus did willingly undertake, that he might discharge, he was made under the law, did perfectly fulfill it. So there you have what's called his active obedience. The Lord Jesus Christ perfectly kept every requirement of the law of God in his deeds, in his words, and even in his mind and in his desires. Everything was holy about him. His act of obedience. And then he endured the most grievous torments in his soul and painful sufferings in his body. And there you have his passive obedience. As God called upon him to suffer in our place. To bear the punishment our sins deserve. And the Holy Spirit sustained him through all of that suffering. And he willingly carried it out. Even though it was a fearful thing to him. And he prayed, oh... Take this cup from me if it's, if it's your will, but not my will, but yours be done. So here we see the Lord Jesus obeying the Father. And as a result of that, the Lord blesses him. He raises him up the third day. He gives him a place in heaven and gives him authority over the earth. And he will come again to judge the earth and in the great last day. So this covenant that Jesus Christ has fulfilled brings benefits to you and to me. By this covenant, it says the Lord Jesus has fully satisfied the justice of his Father, has purchased an everlasting inheritance in the kingdom of heaven for all those whom the Father hath given unto him. If the Father gave you to Jesus, then you have an everlasting inheritance. And then it says that this was done not only for the elect that would live after him, but even those who had already preceded him in history, all the saints, all those, even on that list that we read tonight, all those names, we all are the benefit of Jesus' work on the cross. And he did it for you, and for them, and for me. Christ, in the work of mediation, acts according to both natures, by each nature doing what is proper to itself. Yet by reason of the unity of the person, that which is proper to one nature sometimes in Scripture is attributed to the person denominated by the other nature. That's an interesting sentence. And uh, sounds kind of complicated, but basically what it's saying is that as our Messiah, Jesus had to do things that only God can do, and he had to do things that only a man can do. And uh, But since it was the same person, Jesus Christ, sometimes... In the Bible, it talks about something he did as in his human nature, and it uses the name that he his divine name. And then sometimes he does something the other way around. He does something only a man can do, but it uses his divine name. So it goes both ways. And so on the next slide, let's give you an example of this. In uh, the case of John 3.13, which uh, was read this morning in, in uh, our service here, we have God doing something, but the human name is used for it. 
And no man has ascended up to heaven, Jesus says, but he that came down from heaven. So that's something God did. Jesus, as God, came down from heaven. Not as a man, but as God. He came down from heaven, entered into the uh, flesh of the baby here on the earth. He came down. That's God. But it says the Son of Man did that. So it uses a human name for his coming down. And then on the other hand, a human action, Jesus died on the cross and shed his blood and died. Uh, only a human can do that. God can't do that. But yet it says in Acts 20, the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. Well, does God have blood? No. Matter of fact, some of the Greek copyists, they, they didn't think that was possible, so they changed it to the Lord with his own blood because they didn't like the idea of God having blood. But actually, God is, is, is right. And there is a case where the divine name is used for a human action because it's the single person. So that just shows you how the two natures of Jesus Christ are the same person. And you can call whatever name that person is called for any of the actions done, whether it be a divine action or a human action. Finally, the complete salvation achieved by Christ's work for this covenant. To all for whom Christ hath purchased redemption, he does certainly and effectually apply and communicate the same. Jesus brings you salvation, certainly through the covenant of grace. And it follows here with these wonderful, strong participles. And uh, you know what participles are? Okay, the present participle ends with what three letters? I-N-G. I-N-G, thank you. So we have, how many of them here? I think six, right? Making intercession, revealing to them the mysteries of the salvation, persuading them by his spirit, governing their hearts, and overcoming all their enemies. Maybe that's uh, five. One, two, three, four, five. Yeah. So they're participles. But these participles describe the complete work of the salvation brought to us by Jesus Christ. So in a nutshell, this was a 20-minute nutshell or something here, but in a nutshell, we've gone through these two chapters of the confession that describe the covenant that God makes with man and how Jesus is the one who carries out that covenant. So when Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3 that he is a minister of the new covenant that God has made him an able minister of the new covenant it means that Paul is now experiencing the results of Jesus work in obtaining for us the covenant of grace and when Paul observes those Corinthian Christians repenting doing something a normal sinful human being would never do but they do it, not because of anything in them, but they do it because God has put his spirit in them. And therefore they come and repent. They are a letter from God. The spirit of God is written in their hearts. The spirit given through the new covenant. And this proves to Paul that indeed this ministry that I have, with its sufferings and trials and anxieties, this ministry is not just me. It's God. God is working through me, and he is producing through me these results, the results by the Holy Spirit working according to the new covenant obtained by the Savior, the Lord Jesus. Now, please turn back for a moment to 2 Corinthians just uh, for a minute. We'll look at 2 Corinthians once more. How can we honor and imitate those who are ministers of the new covenant whose names we have read this evening? In 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 2, I'd just like to point out a couple things. First thing, we have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. First thing, speaking the truth plainly, not with deception, not with distortion. We may not be very eloquent preachers, 
but we can tell the truth. We can preach the word of God. And when you preach the truth that's in the word of God, that's the means that God uses. His spirit uses the word in the hearer's hearts to bring them to faith and repentance. And that new covenant blessing is fulfilled through that preaching. <coughs> so we don't preach with distortion or deception and try to preach in such a way that people are going to agree with what I say. I think uh, during our synod sessions, Brother Bacchus mentioned the burned over district in New York where there was a lot of very powerful preaching, great emotional appeals, people changing their whole lives and directions of their thoughts as they listened to these eloquent preachers, but the spirit of God was not in it. It was a human spirit. And now it's called the burned over district because the gospel is pretty dead there and it's hard to get a foothold again. We don't have that kind of preaching. And then we notice also in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3 through 6, we are preaching the Christ of glory. If our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of those who believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. We preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord. The focus on the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is the type of preaching, like chapter 8 of our confession. That's the type of preaching that God uses. So, we follow their example in our preaching. I think we can also follow their example in not leaning on our own strength, but on the strength of Jesus Christ. And here, of course, we have the very famous passage starting in verse 7. We have this treasure in earthen vessels, <laughs> and the power is not of us, it is of God. And even though we're cast down, even though we stumble, even though we become perplexed, God holds us up and continues that ministry. So it's depending on the strength of God. And finally, these men have come to their reward. You know, I talked about boring sermons at the beginning. Take the most boring Bible Presbyterian ministry you can think of in time past. The one that was you were the least desirous of hearing a sermon from <laughs> late at night. <laughs> and if he could come back now and talk to us, you think it'd be a good sermon? <laughs> to use the expression, it'd blow your socks off, right? It would be it would be delightful. It would be the best thing you've ever heard in your whole life. That same person. And you know, in this life, we're not there yet. But when we get to glory, that's when that full potential that God has created for us will come into flower. And so Paul looks ahead for that as a minister of the Lord Jesus. And he says here in chapter 4, verse 13, we have the same spirit of faith I believe and therefore I have spoken. We believe and therefore speak. And then he talks about the resurrection. He which raised up the Lord shall raise us up by Jesus. And then he talks about how we don't faint because, verse 17, our light affliction, which is but for a moment, works for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen, the things that are seen are temporal, the things which are not seen are eternal. So as we conclude this memorial service tonight, let us honor these men, but let us fix our eyes on the Lord of the covenant, the Christ of the covenant, our Lord Jesus. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we give thanks for the great work done by our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for his love for his great sacrifice, for his faithful intercession, for his power and wisdom as he directs his spirit in the affairs of his church. We thank you, Lord, that he is coming again and we shall see him face to face. And we know if we go depart this life before that point comes, that we shall be changed from glory to glory and we shall see him in his glory. Give us, we pray, that faith, that wonderful inspiration 
and cause us then to be faithful ministers of the new covenant. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.